So now we move to our second speaker, Dr. Leonie Huddy. She's a SUNY Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Political Science. And I just want to say, we have some amazing chairs, but I will say I believe you are one of the most creative, strategic, and, and just calculated risk, thoughtful chairs I have ever met in my entire life. So, uh, yeah, let's. And she's only been here since 1988. So her talk today is A Nation Divided, Partisan Identity and the Psychology of Political Polarization. And to give her a appropriately thorough introduction, we have Professor Ryan Vander Whelan. He's the director of the master's program in public policy and an associate professor in the political science department. A few things about him. Uh, he's been at Stony Brook since 2020, um, an excellent hire for the department. His expertise is in legislative politics with a focus on US Congress. His work examines strategic legislative behavior and whether voters hold elective representatives accountable for their behavior in office. That's a novel concept. His recent work is focused on how changes in the news media landscape have affected congressional elections and members' voting behavior. I will also say, as a social and behavioral scientist, it's really hard to be a truly gifted, rigorous statistician, someone who really truly understands methodologies and how to, uh, and how to approach questions from that sort of methodological rigor and also have clear, thoughtful content area research. And to be able to do both of those together is in, in the way that Ryan does is, is truly impressive. And you really see that in his classes and in, in the ability to teach some of these really challenging methodological classes and try to kind of draw out these quant skills in students in ways that is really rigorous but also nurturing and, and we all struggle with what is the best ways to do that and he is truly a, a, a great example of that. And he has an amazing sock game. I don't know if you've ever noticed but he always has great socks. So with that, we will have Ryan come up. really appreciate the sock recognition. That's uh... <laughs> So uh, I'd like to thank you and everyone else involved in making this fantastic lecture series possible. This is, uh, this is a great thing. I mean, this fantastic talk. Um, and uh, you know, Stony Brook has a remarkable amount of talent, and so this is a, a great way to showcase it. Um, it's an enormous honor to, to introduce our next speaker, who is yet another example of the world-class talent at Stony Brook. Uh, Leonie Huddy is a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Political Science and the current department chair. And uh, I will say that uh, when I was asked to offer some introductory remarks, I, of course, uh, responded uh, enthusiastically and, ha and happily yes, and then, uh, and then following that I had a panic attack when I, when I realized what I had done. I had, uh, I had agreed to the impossible task of trying to capture Leone's uh, contributions in the span of a very brief uh, introduction, so I will, I'll do my best to, to do her many accomplishments a service. Um, so uh, Leone received her PhD in psychology from UCLA in 1989 and, and began her illustrious career here at Stony Brook that same year. Uh, she's the former president of the International Society of Political Psychology and has served as the editor or on the editorial board uh, of, of over a dozen of the top journals in political science. Uh, she has amassed over $1 million in grant money, and the list of her publications is uh, jaw-dropping. Uh, she has published scores of books and articles in all of the top venues in the discipline. Uh, but what makes Leone's scholarship so special is not necessarily the quantity, but, but its quality and its lasting impact. Uh, so as a little bit of evidence uh, to this point, I did the uh, rather humbling deep dive into her Google Scholar citation counts and, uh, and, and discovered that she, she ranks among the top 25 scholars in, 
uh, in terms of uh, citations in five different uh, areas of study. And these are not trivial areas of study, these are like Herculean areas of study, like political behavior and public opinion. So uh, really impressive stuff. And she ranks number one in the important area of uh, women in politics. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that Leone is a, is a giant in the field and certainly one of the preeminent scholars in the area of uh, political psychology. Her work has been foundational in terms of our understanding of political identities, intergroup relations, and uh, the implications of gender stereotypes in politics, just to name a, a few of her many contributions. And her work seems to be more and more relevant uh, almost by the day as we enter an increasingly hostile and divisive uh, political climate marked by uh, intense partisanship. Uh, I would be remiss if I concluded without mentioning uh, uh, her other contributions to our students and faculty, which, which are, are no less extraordinary, uh, as, as uh, some of our uh, PhD students here today can attest. She is a, uh, an exceedingly generous and rigorous advisor and, and her graduate students have gone on to join the faculty at some of the, the top programs in the country like Duke, Columbia, NYU, Johns Hopkins, Emory. I'm sure some of you have heard of, of these places. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, in, in any event, and, and her students have made uh, many valuable contributions of, her, of, of their own, so uh, uh, really impressive the mark that she's left on her students as well. Uh, she's also an unceasing advocate for the department and its faculty, and her scholarship and leadership have, have contributed to building a department with a national reputation in political psychology, American politics, and political methodology. Quite honestly, I, I, I don't know how she does it all. Uh, I hate to take time away from her talk, so I'll wrap things up by saying uh, I'm enormously proud uh, to call her a colleague and a friend, and I know that's a, a sentiment shared by many of you in this room today. So, Professor Leone Huddy. Well, thank you, Ryan, for that very generous introduction. And thanks to Carl for doing this. It really is amazing. I have been here for an awfully long time. Um, and it's really true that we don't really hear what each of us are doing in very different parts of the university. Um, so this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, I am a political psychologist, so I am inherently interdisciplinary. I am trained in psychology. I've spent my life looking at political science. Um, and one of the things I end up doing is trying to bring some realism to the study of ordinary people and the way they relate to politics. Often what I'm arguing against is a form of economic rationality. We're often trying to explain, hey, people are really, and apologies to economists, people do not think about politics in an extremely rational fashion. So I'm going to try and share that perspective with you today. I, this is not judgmental, this is just how on earth do people make sense of this political world? Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the political divisions um, in, uh, let me do this too, I've got it, um, in, in, in our current politics. And we're moving from the body to the body politic, and I wish I had solutions like TAVA to uh, help solve our political problems. I'm going to share some thoughts about how we might ameliorate some of the problems that we're facing currently in American politics. But we're focusing a little bit here on um, partisan polarization and the deep divisions that we see emerging in American society. These extend beyond just disagreements over beliefs to those terrible arguments over Thanksgiving dinner, uh, the crazy email exchanges, the weird messages that you get from strange relatives. Um, and we've also seen some of our colleagues showing that people increasingly say they don't want their children to marry someone from the other political side. Uh, so things are not good out there. Um, I'm going to try and convince you they're not quite as bad as they may appear. Um, and so I, I'll share that perspective with you. Um, but what I wanted to say is we're, I, I'm going to take a turn back to partisanship. This may be a concept that you think you know about. I see a lot of political scientists here, and you can close your eyes and not listen to this part because we talk about partisanship all the time. But what I want to say is it's not just about policy issues. People get deeply attached to politics. And this isn't quite as bad as a calcified aortic valve, but um, you can see that people brand themselves, that they get very, very deeply in on their political views to the point of putting it on their bodies. Um, and so, um, 
what I wanted to do is take you back to some history, and this is kind of social science history. Um, what you're looking at here are three of our luminaries in the study of voting behavior. Uh, this is Phil Converse, Warren Miller, and Donald Stokes, who wrote a book in 1960 launching basically election studies. Uh, they were the first ones to really investigate uh, how people thought about politics and launch what has become now an ongoing American national election study uh, project that is funded by the NSF and continues to this day. But what they did is they developed what became an incredibly popular American export, and it's called partisanship. Um, doesn't sound very dramatic, but what they realized is that it is a psychological attachment. So when people talk about partisanship, it's not a membership. I don't think many of you are card-carrying members of your political party. You don't have an actual membership. But what happens is you carry around something in your head. And that something is a connection also to other people. We, they defined it as a deeply rooted affective bond, so it is emotional. It has a sense of warmth towards the political party and others in that party. Um, and they thought of it, they defined it as something maybe akin to uh, my parents were Catholics, they belonged to a union, I grew up with this, this is part of who I am. Um, so this is, this is the concept that they developed. And this has migrated around the world. Almost all democracies have a national election study. In the old days, this was funded you know, re regularly. These days, we have other ways of collecting data. But this, these were very big projects. And each one of them would ask this question about an attachment, and again, a psychological attachment to a political party. And I'm going to come back and argue, you may think that's crazy. Sometimes students say this partisanship is ridiculous. But the truth is, without this, people don't really have a stake in what's going on in an election. So it's a form of psychological attachment that also lends some stability to our political system. That may be not a controversial statement, and I'll come back and try and back that up. Um, but this kind of connection helps people see that there is something at stake for them in an election. Um, what we have seen, and, and let me tell you, if you've ever taken a political survey of any kind, you would have been asked this question. And the question is, do you think of yourself as a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, or something else? It's a very simple question. If, if you say, yes, I'm a Democrat, Republican, you're asked, are you a strong or not so strong version of that? What you can see on this graph is that if we look at the green line, which is the one that's going up at the end, those are people who say that they are strong partisans. So we are seeing an uptick in a strong partisanship over time. Um, and there are lots of interesting reasons. You can ask me questions about that. Why are we getting this strengthening attachment to the political parties? What's interesting is that back in the 1970s, people were saying partisanship is kind of dead. It's, it's really nothing, you know, we're worried about it, we're losing it, it's gone. People are not attached any longer to the political parties, so nothing could be further from the truth today, that we really have plenty of partisanship. Um, so uh, so this, their notion, this notion that came out of the University of Michigan, and it's referred to as the Michigan School, those guys, when you saw them sitting there, were sitting around at the Institute for Social Research at Michigan, which became an incredibly important center for social science research after the Second World War. The National Science Foundation poured money into the big projects that were being conducted there. They were large national surveys in different areas, economics, political science, psychology. Um, so uh, when they did that, there was some discussion afterwards about, okay, we've got this partisanship. Is it really something that is to do with policies and interests? Is that what it is? Or is it something that is linked to that, but is more like an identity that can be divorced from those policies at some level? Or you can be, if, if you have this identity, you can be convinced to adopt policy positions because you do identify with this political party. We see plenty of evidence for this. Um, so there were some competing models there. It's sort of a hot head that's a very simple-minded distinction, but one that we often throw around in social science. Is it something intellectual that's thought through? Is it based on a reasoned set of propositions? Or is it something that is more difficult to change? It's an enduring identity that um, has a lot of stability to it. 
um, that, that more the, the head model, the instrumental model up there, suggested that people would react and punish a party that didn't perform well in office. That they'd be quick to turn on them, they'd move to another political party, moving on. The policy positions don't match, the party isn't performing well. So then, if, if, if it were like that, partisanship would be more volatile. It turns out not to be the case. It's an unbelievably stable construct. This may lend some insight into the current election. We can come back to that too, because everyone is so interested in what's going to happen. But this partisanship tends to stay over time. It can erode, it, become, it can become weakened, someone can shift maybe slowly but surely to become a political independent if they don't like what's happening in their political party, but it doesn't turn on a dime. It is, again, an internalized concept that's reasonably stable. And we'll say, and you know, this will be true in the current election, if you say you're a Democrat, 90% of people will vote for the Democratic candidate. And the same will be true on the Republican side. People do not switch gears that easily. Um, so this concept of partisanship is pretty important. When we look at what kind of concepts we measure in our surveys in political science, it is by far and away the most popular, most common concept that is measured. It appears in almost all political, political science articles, we would find it. Um, so I wanted to tell you about, in this competition between the instrumental, sorry, and the um, expressive approach, some years ago, uh, with a very talented graduate, who was then a graduate student at Stony Brook, Lily Mason, who's now at Johns Hopkins, and Lena Aro, who was visiting from Aarhus University as a PhD student, we decided to dig into this further. That simple question I was telling you about is basically, are you strong or not strong as a partisan? And that didn't seem to capture the intensity with which people were enacting partisan behaviors, tattooing themselves, doing things that were far more extreme. And so borrowing from psychology, we decided to develop a new measure of how to get at this kind of partisanship. Um, and so we published an article, and I should say in political science, it's not very common that three women publish an article in one of the top journals, so I'm always very proud of that fact as well. It still remains a somewhat male field. Um, so in doing this, we decided to ask a bunch of questions. And this again is drawn very much from insights from psychology about how we get at this mental connection that people have with a group, and that's what we would call this. We'd call it a social identity. It's a connection to other people at bottom. Um, so we ask questions just because we want to get more indication. Our social science questions are inexact. People do not have a file drawer where they can pull out answers to these questions in their head. So we ask multiple questions to try and situate them uh, as reliably as we can. So you can see here, one of the important things that I want you to see here is we ask these four questions. How important is it? How well does it describe you? Do you say we? Because this is getting at the group aspect of this. I feel connected to the other people who are part of this. Um, and, and to what extent do you think of yourself? What I want you to focus on is that density plot. What you will see there is great variety. These are Democrats and Republicans. It's one of our recent surveys. We ask this question a lot, or those questions. And you'll see that, you know, Americans are just like almost at 0.6. If we go from zero, they say they're a Democrat or Republican, but they have no affection for the political party whatsoever, to one where you're all the way in on all of those questions. Um, you can see great variety, and that if we think about crazy partisans, there are some of them out there on the end, but there are a lot of people with middling level attachments. And this is important because in our current dialogue discussions, we just talk about Democrats and Republicans as if they are one entity. And what we know about these groups and these identities is if you identify very strongly, you are more likely to conform to whatever leaders, for example, are saying, this is really true, you're more likely to be convinced if they say, now we support this particular policy, you'll shift gears and support that policy. And we'll also see some of the bad behavior that, <clears throat> that we're seeing in our world is concentrated among people at that more intense end of this attachment. And I should add that these are not idiots, uh, sometimes what we see is that people with strong attachments tend to be very well informed. Or they have a lot of information, they are very consumed by politics, 
they're very attached, um, and they also practice a lot of defensive reasoning. <laughs> so they are very good at arguing, they, they're really good at arguing against facts and so on. But again, I want you to remember that a lot of people are in the middle and not exhibiting these most extreme forms of partisanship. And I think that is getting lost to some extent in our conversation that Americans tend to be a bit on the centrist side when it comes to politics despite appearances right now. Um, and again, this is a topic du jour in our news media. Everyone's so polarized. But we have to take a step back from that and realize that not everyone is actually like that. Um, so what I want to do then is talk a little bit about the connection between these strong attachments and animosity. And what you'll see on the right-hand side of that is the growing sense of dislike that people who call themselves Democrats or call themselves Republicans have for the other political side. And if you look at that, it's a Pew, it's from Pew, it starts in 94, goes up to 2022. You can see that unfavorable is in the 75% range, so partisans don't like the other side, but we're also seeing an increase in people who say they have very unfavorable views. And sometimes we ask questions like stereotypes, some of the common things that people agree to is that people on the other side are immoral, they're idiots, you know, you've all heard, I'm sure you've all heard these kinds of comments about people who are on the, the other political side. Um, so this is related to being a strong partisan. The stronger I am as a partisan, the more likely I am to endorse these kinds of negative views. There is some idea that there are people who aren't as attached to the parties who also hold this kind of what's being called negative partisanship. So there can be some animos additional animosity out there, but it's very strongly related to being a strong partisan. So if you're a moderate partisan, if you're a, a weaker partisan, this animosity is likely to be less pronounced. So again, it's important to remember that we have this kind of graded intensity of these partisan identities that will have further ramifications. And I wanted to put in a plug for Lily's book because the other thing that can happen here is spill over to violence. So Lily Mason, who is a Stony Brook PhD, you may have seen her on television. She's become quite a national spokesperson talking about partisanship. Wrote a book recently about it in a very prescient view with Nate Kelmo about looming violence. And this, was, this came out, they were doing their research before January 6th. They're looking at strong partisans. They could see the spillover from animosity towards the condoning of violence. We don't believe that people necessarily all will take these actions. But there are quite a few people who say, yeah, it's probably OK to hit them. You know, it's up in the 20% range. You know, like, sure, why not? You know, um, So we're seeing this nascent violence also, which again is related to being a strong partisan. It, it's irritating, it's annoying, and you just want to get rid of them somehow, quieten them down, shut them up. Um, so, um, so I just want to show you then some negative and then maybe some positive aspects of partisanship, and then we'll come back to talk a little bit about how the hell do we get rid of some of this animosity. This research has been done with Joseph Sander, who is a PhD student, just, just recently about to finalize Defend. He defended and got a little bit more work to do, but he was focused on fake news and the spreading of, of fake news. And I should give a shout out to Brian, who was here, maybe he's gone, but anyway, Brian uh, Gay in our department is also looking at the spread of misinformation. I know this is a hot topic across different areas, but it's one that we're interested in in politics but it's also occurring in the area of climate change. Um, we're looking, we certainly saw a lot of it in, during the COVID period. So we are very interested in these topics in political psychology. So if we just have a look at some of this, it is kind of alarming and we're gonna see more of it uh, very shortly. Um, but if you look at the 2006, 2017, um, fake political news spread faster on Twitter, generated more retweets and was spread by a larger number of users than real news and fake news in other domains. So it, it's a bit, we'll come back to the catnip notion, but it's very, you know, it's very tempting to share fake political news. Um, and then if we looked at the 2016 election, fake news article, articles were shared more often than factual news articles in the months before the 2016 election. So we're heading into the same territory, unfortunately. I mean, this, this, there may be even more of this. Um, so our interest was in trying to figure out who spreads this kind of information? 
And one of the things we know, there's a very active area of research in psychology. We also know that people are very willing to share information that is fake, and they know it's fake. They actually don't care that it's fake. Um, we've asked people about this. They say, oh, this is a fake piece of information, but I'd like to share it. You say, why is that? And they said, oh, it's funny. Right, it's funny. Um, so that just suggests to me that it's also related to their identities. They're sharing it with like-minded people. Everyone has a good laugh, and they move on. Um, so in these studies, what we typically do, as I said, it's like political catnip. So if you're a Democrat, you're shown a common, a common trope that you can see on these misinformation sites. One is about Marco Rubio saying rape victims should be in custody, and these are actual things that people share online. And the other was uh, Trump saying, I have done more for Christianity than Jesus, right? So this is, these, were, these are common, like we didn't make these up, and, and they're taken straight from some of these fact-checking sites. This is the kind of stuff that people are sharing. Um, and typically in these studies, we will expose people to these headlines and ask them, how likely are you to share these? We're also asking them, they need to be on social media, so they are people who have social media accounts. And I'll show you in a minute, some of them say they're willing to share political information, others not, but they're asked a series of questions. Would you share it with friends, with strangers? Would you retweet it? What would you do? Um, and we also have some for Republicans. We've got Omar, Ilan Omar, dismantling of the US economy, and Hillary Clinton. We saw a lot of this in 2016 about child sex cults and so on. So these are, these are what uh, people are exposed to. They might be exposed to half a dozen or so, eight of these, and then ask questions about them. Um, what I first want to show you is that strong partisans are most likely to say they're interested in sharing them. Um, this looks good to them. Uh, again, regardless of whether they think it's accurate or not. And what I'm showing you here is um, a scale. So let me try and explain this. On that y-axis, we have a scale from zero to one. 0.5 is a kind of sharing line. Under 0.5, you're not so sure if you're going to share it. Maybe you won't. Zero is definitely not. One would definitely be sharing across a bunch of articles. What you can see here is that Republicans are more eager and more willing in these studies to share than Democrats. This is, has been a somewhat consistent finding in the research. Um, I'm not going to show you here why that is, but it looks Part of the reason it's disturbing is that Republicans inhabit a very unreliable news environment. We've asked people, where do you get your news? Checked it for its veracity. And the truth is that a lot of Republicans are living in a wonky, upside-down world. Um, they're really not being exposed to real news. Democrats tend to inhabit a much more accurate end of a spectrum on news reliability. This, I think, helps to explain why you're getting more sharing among Republicans than Democrats of these ideas because people don't really, they've lost track of what's actually real. Uh, they've been exposed to so many weird ideas that um, they just think, sure, that's possible. Joe Biden's a crook, you know, he's corrupt. Even though a lot of these things get discredited, they may never hear this piece of information. So I also want to show you that um, if we break out on the next graph, uh, people who say, I would never share anything um, about politics on social media, that's the bottom graph, or the top one are partisans who say they would. Again, if we look at the 0.5 sort of line, you can start to see that strong partisans are definitely moving into the sharing territory. Now again, these are hypotheticals. They're just like, would you be willing? It's not asking them to actually do it. Other studies have done that and, and see some that have actually studied people's behavior on Twitter, and we can see some of this happening. But there is definitely a desire among strong partisans to share and what is uniformly bad news about the other side, right? These are terrible things about the other side. They're idiots, you know, they're doing crazy things. Some people are willing to believe it. Um, others are not so sure about it, but still it makes them feel good. They're angry with the other side. That motivates them to share this kind of content. Um, so um, this may be controversial. This is, so that's the bad news. Uh, strong partisans are very willing to make the other side look bad. And we would argue that when you're a strong member of any group, when you identify with it and you face threat, you want to strike back. And if you're a strongly identified individual, you are most likely you want to strike back. You get very, you're more emotional about it. You get angrier. They're evil. We've studied this too, that strong partisans just react more emotionally to threats from the other political party. 
The other side of this is that, and this is just an example, these are two different studies, older studies, about people who are strong partisans, whether or not they get involved in an election. And the truth is that someone who is a strong partisan has been more likely to work for a candidate, give them money, um, and the same for the political party. So without these strong partisans, we wouldn't have democratic engagement, right? This is the, the I call it like a form of sports fandom, right? We are sort of in that territory. It is not a deep, it's not a purely intellectual exercise, right? We're in a sort of team sport world. So if you think about it that way, maybe that will help to uh, understand a little about what is going on out there. So the next question is, you know, what can we do about this? And um, I'm going to tell you next about a study that we conducted trying to decrease this animosity towards people on the other side. But I should say, when we're looking at these strong partisans and they identify with a political group, their leaders turn out to be pretty important in terms of defining what good behavior is, uh, what we believe, there's a conformity around known, recognized leaders. So in the next study that I'm going to tell you about, it's kind of a gossipy piece about Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell in a restaurant. Uh, so this is why their two faces are there. Um, and this research was done with Omar Yair, who was a postdoc from Israel at Stony Brook. We ran, and I should add, and we do a lot of surveys, but we often do little experiments in our surveys. So we expose people to different kinds of information. And this, if you follow the Hill, this was kind of a gossipy story, like a gossipy story from the Hill, about diners saw these two guys at a restaurant. Um, and in the warm condition, they were being very nice. They were drinking and laughing, as senators used to do across the aisle. This was not uncommon. Um, and they looked happy, and they parted with a hug. In another condition, they were using obscenities. They were arguing loudly. Uh, they were extremely angry. Their wives were hostile towards each other. This is a little scenario. In addition, we had them agreeing or disagreeing. So in other words, they were either yelling at each other and agreeing on issues, or they were yelling at each other and disagreeing, or they were being nice to each other and agreeing, or they were being nice and disagreeing. And the question is, can we move the needle for someone who's a Democrat or someone who's a Republican to make them like the other side a little bit more? Uh, some people might argue it's going to happen with compromise, you know, if we agree, if we decide we agree on the issues. That is not what happens. This is driven by how nice these two guys are to each other. So what I'm going to show you next is a bar chart. Just don't worry about too much about the details. There were several conditions, but look at that light gray bar on the right-hand side of each condition. It's higher. Um, now, 0.5 is the liking, disliking point. So again, we haven't really made them like the other people on the other political side, but what we've done is make them dislike them a little bit less when they saw McConnell and Schumer having a nice dinner together. And the issue of compromise or no compromise, um, it, it's really hostility. It's hostility that really, um, it can make them even more negative. Um, there may be a little bit going on with compromise, but in our analyses, it's all driven by this warmth. Um, and in a second study, the same kind of thing, that it is the warmth condition that is making people feel a little less negative towards people on the other side. Um, and again, this is consistent with an identity approach that it isn't just about policy issues. It is possible for people to disagree and not hate people on the other side. This was our partisanship of the past. Um, so one implication here um, is that the deteriorating conditions among our political leaders are having adverse effects on people. No one is suggesting that they hold the same ideas but um, when they shout and call each other names and do that visibly and publicly, it lends this idea that the other, the other side are immoral idiots, uh, we hate them, and we're not going to have anything to do with them. Um, so let me just say that this, I'm not taking credit for this, but this study was published a few years ago, and subsequently there was a big competition, came out of Stanford, it was a research competition between different teams trying to see can we decrease negativity towards people on the other political side? Um, and the answer is yes, we can do it. Some of the, the most successful of these, and these were competitive research projects, involved this kind of contact, positive contact between politicians of the other side. 
So you can see here on uh, the left-hand side, Spencer Cox, who is the, was then running for governor of Utah and won, created an ad with his opponent saying, yes, we disagree, but we like each other. We don't hate each other. It's okay to disagree. Um, you can see an example that a Abigail Spamboga um, was endorsed by a Republican in her last election bid. And then Spencer Cox is now chair of the National Governors Association. So what I want to do is wave over there, and I'm going to show you a video. So I wanted to end on a positive note. So I think if I can, or maybe I have to do this. Maybe this is the real. I'm Spencer Cox, okay. Republican governor of Utah. And I'm Jared Polis, Democratic governor of Colorado. And we're here to help save your family dinners. You know what we're talking about. You're halfway through your second helping of mashed potatoes when your MAGA uncle decides to share his thoughts on the latest election conspiracy. We all have that uncle. Or instead of passing the salt, your woke niece passes along a particularly controversial fact that she read on social media. Or maybe you're the one with the strong opinions. You know you're right and the other side is a bunch of misguided weirdos but there's a healthy way to deal with conflicting opinions actually it's okay to disagree it's not just okay it's crucial did you just disagree with me about disagreeing healthy disagreement means not assuming that the other side is deluded misinformed or actively trying to overthrow America a little respect and curiosity keeps resentment off the dinner table and out of your social media feeds. Our nation was founded by people who profoundly disagreed. So next time your uncle, your niece, or anyone else brings up that one topic that just drives you nuts, take a deep breath. Be curious, ask questions. If you still disagree, that's okay, but you might find that you aren't as far apart as you think. Conflict isn't bad. It's the way we disagree that matters. Please join us in showing America the right kind of conflict. Together, we can disagree better. So this is, so this is, so what I want to say about this is that, um, and these are good ideas. I mean, these are ideas that come out of psychology about how to reduce conflict. So I'd like you to think of a few things. One first point is that people are not as divided as we imagine. The crazy partisans are a small group of people. Um, and we should keep that in mind. The second is that this incivility among our political leaders is bad news. Um, it's definitely not helping matters. Um, it's, it, people have lost track of policies, they're just screaming at each other um, over things that really are not consequential. Um, so the question is, can techniques like this work? We have an organization on campus called Bridge USA. Every year, the, it's a student-run uh, event where a group of people sit around on tables, I often participate, and we disagree. It's very hard because everyone agrees at Stony Brook. They're all, everyone's on the left. So I'm often playing devil's advocate, trying to present the right side. But um, this is an important piece of this. The question is, as much as this National Governors Association is doing this, our politics is very dominated by national. So we're going to see a very dirty, divisive, terrible presidential campaign that's going to go low. I don't know if they can, they can work this, but uh, the truth is we just don't hear a lot about this. I don't know if anyone from journalism is here, but I know we've been talking about local journalism. In the old days, there might be national news stories about something like this. In Utah, you might be reading about Spencer Cox running this kind of campaign, which is incredibly important, but you won't see it in the national news. Uh, for, for various reasons. So anyway, hopefully I haven't solved any problems. There's no TAVA, um, but maybe a little bit of this could go a long way. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, great talk, Leone. Thank you, Provost Lachoy, for the uh, series, which is awesome. Um, and I hope I don't come across as the rationalist <laughs> in asking this question. Yep. If I understood you correctly, it's not merely that warmth is strictly required for us to move the needle, which you said is very hard to do, but at least get us in the room to becoming receptive to doing so. But increasingly, that seems hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, i just get personal a little bit. I'm a Jewish person who's increasingly be accused of anti-Semitism for criticizing Israel and for raising in this very room a, uh, two Senate meetings ago, the idea with the de debate things that are hard to discuss, not being invited into certain rooms, and, and, and kind of uh, bore some harsh criticism, criticism from a couple friends who were colleagues for, for suggesting that things be debated, that there aren't one answer you know, to, to certain questions. 
My question is, when I brought this up in the Faculty Student Association, and I'm, I'm on that as well, a student said, you know, acknowledging the well-intended query, students do not want to be, you know, shoveled into a room to have to hear a different kind of perspective. I mean, I doubted I, this account, but I'm hearing it more and more. It seems hard to get people in a room to discuss things and be forced to withstand the cognitive dissonance that doesn't cohere with the narrative with which they're comfortable. Now, that makes sense in light of what you said about warmth, but I guess my question is twofold. Am I antiquated? Am I sort of naive in thinking that part of this also involves reason, coming to actually understand the perspective of another from, for, for reasons you can understand? And if the answer to that question is yes, and it's not simply about warmth and feeling, how do we do it? How do we get there? Well, so I think there's several parts to that question. One is about how we empathize with other people. And some of it, we, we have these different techniques, perspective taking, which may not involve emotion, but may just be simply understanding someone else's point of view or warmth. They go together. I mean, they do go together to some extent. So hostility is always going, I think, to diminish perspective taking. Right, it's going to be hard. When someone is yelling and screaming at you, it is very hard to get around that and take their perspective. So some of it is bringing, bringing down the temperature, making people less defensive, because usually what it is is that your identity is on the line. Right? Suddenly you feel you're representing the entire team. Right? Now, if you were just hanging out together, like if people can admit, hey, our team isn't that great. You know, sometimes we've got some problems there, and we're hearing a lot of that within our parties. Um, but it's very hard to admit that to the other side. And so, I mean, it, it's very difficult to know what to do. If someone is not willing to bring the temperature down, um, as I said, we have this bridge USA, maybe uh, Gaza is a good topic. That is going to be a real test of whether people in that room are willing to be able to talk across that and see these different sides. Um, but I think you know, hostility doesn't help matters. Let's put it that way. You know, hostility is not good. If you're going to argue with someone and start screaming at them, the game is over, right? There is no way forward. Um, so whether you like them or not, you, maybe you don't need to like them that much, but screaming at them will not help. Um, so I encourage anyone who's interested in Bridge USA, it's a group of students who organize that. It's a very nice event if anyone wants to take part in that. Um, it's an interesting evening. I had another question, especially about like um, my generation, I'm Generation Z, especially consuming a lot of information and content through social media. Um, a lot of statistics start to show that like we're consuming content through social media, which uh, kind of pander towards our specific identities to have us like consume more content. And because of that, I think what I've noticed amongst my peers actually is just a lot of people kind of going into echo tunnels, uh, echo chambers of constantly uh, uh, not considering their own uh, criticisms to their um, like their identity um, and not having those debates either. Um, I think one thing is that like whenever they do have um, comments on any political stance, it tends to just be reiterated towards people that already agree with uh, what they say. So how do we um, encourage this debate? How do we push it towards our my generation, especially since we're going to be soon or we are voting already? So. Um, I, you know, I mean, one comment about also younger generation is news consumption. So a lot of people now say they get their news from social media, which means sometimes you're not sure where it's coming from. So we ask this sometimes in surveys, they say, what news organization? And people say Facebook. It's like, no, it's really not a news generation. It's not generating news, you know, it's not doing that. So one is to read, you know, read more widely, um, is to look at different sources. As we said, the worst thing that you can do is start telling someone they're an idiot for their political views. This is, this is not going to help. So one thing is to read up a little bit and present some facts or take a political science class. We're really good. I'm, gonna, I'm putting a plug for the department. Really good at trying to keep that conversation right in the middle. I mean, Jay will attest to this so that students don't really know what your political view is. So um, I don't know that that happens everywhere, but. Um, Consuming a variety of news sources will be helpful, and checking the, the veracity of your news, right? So that's one of the things, if you look online, you can decide, 
Is this news source reputable? Um, I, I guess we still have a news literacy class in journalism, so you can also take one of those classes and figure out how do I fact check? How do I figure out if this video is really related to this event or something that happened five years ago and is unrelated to the event? So we're seeing a lot of things that are just not true either that are circulating. So I don't know that there's any magic bullet, but if you're willing to take some steps yourself, read more widely and bring in some controversial positions in a relaxed setting <laughs> where it, it's not like the stakes are too high um, and see if you can have that dialogue. I think I also heard of like some programs about like media literacy being pushed in like more high schools and more like basic level yeah. education too. That would probably uh, well, help. Stony Brook has been a leader in this in in the School of Journalism and Communications, developing a news literacy program that has migrated to high schools, and some of that is trying to figure out sources. Is this a reliable source that's being quoted in the story? Now we've got to check photos and videos because they could be fake, or they could be from another event. Um, and how well argued, you're a college student, how well argued is the, the information in the story? Are people presenting bogus arguments or are they well-reasoned arguments? So I don't know that there's any like magic bullet except consuming high quality news sources and we hope they survive. This is our, you know, this is our concern about our news environment that it is declining. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, a real issue, I think, a real issue. Thank you. Thanks. Leonie, Thank you. I would yeah. like to ask you about your perspective. What happens when the uh, rules of the game are being broken, that uh, you're concerned about uh, the other side not necessarily obeying the democratic uh, type of uh, framework of uh, rules? <laughs> we hope our institutions hold. <laughs> um, you know, we saw an example in 2020 where we were not sure that our electoral institutions would hold. They did. Um, it, it's, it's a worry, right? We live in a country with institutions and rules. Um, and there are techniques. Again, this is a whole conversation about how you weaken people's commitment or support for our institutions. One are accusations of corruption. This is one thing, once you start accusing someone of corruption, um, you start to see support for our institutions erode. So as you watch what's happening with our politics, you can recognize certain things that are being tried, right, they're being attempted, because it's out of a playbook. It's a right-wing playbook. Um, you know, there's a menu. There's a menu of these things, and we have seen some of those put into practice. Again, the American public, I have some faith, it is kind of centrist. I mean, we'll see what happens going forward in this election, but it is a centrist public despite appearances. Um, I think some people were very turned off by January 6th. Again, we don't quite know how things will turn out. There's the, the problem of an unreliable news environment for a segment of our population that is deeply disturbing because then it's very difficult to combat that kind of misinformation when people accept it as truth. So you just have to cross your fingers, hope the media, news media survives, that our electoral officials hold firm, uh, and that they are supported by at least some segment of the American public. But uh, nothing is a given, and, you know, <laughs> biting our fingernails. <sighs> yes. Um, so we heard a lot about how social media can be used to um, sort of fuel the increasing polarization in politics. So um, I'm sort of curious, how can social media be used to do the opposite, where um, it can be used as a medium to decrease polarization instead? I mean, we've seen efforts to do things like fact-checking, right, on so with social media organizations sort of trying to take this on themselves. They haven't done a very good job. Uh, some of these are moving targets. Um, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of what happens on social media is not political, right? So most of it is not really political. It's a small segment of what's going on. But I think we conclude, I sort of conclude fact-checking is not going to work, right? Simply telling people, and partly because, as I said, people don't really care if it's true or not, right? If it serves their political purpose, they don't, they don't worry about whether it's fact-checked. Um, so we also have a segment of the population creating chaos, 
I didn't mention this, but there are, we have a scale in political psychology, people who score highly on need for chaos. Those people all by themselves are very happy to share all kinds of information online. Just to, the questions are things like, let's just blow it up. Um, so there are some people who endorse this idea and they're just out there to sow the seeds of you know, discord. Um, so it's hard to say, you could get off social media, that might be one solution. We could like close down Facebook and uh, uh, Elon Musk is doing a pretty good job with Twitter in terms of closing that down. So, um, but you know, these, I don't know that they have been all that helpful. Uh, this ability to find crazy people like you and spread terrible information to them has not been a democratic high point. Thank you. So. Yeah. I'm one of those Stony Brook lefties, first of all, so full disclosure. I'm also part of the communications team, so I'm primarily focused with accuracy with things I do. So I wanna, something, the very last thing you showed in your presentation that uh, the commercial by the two, a way to bridge the gap, basically. Mm -hmm. The first guy said, we're, don't assume the other side is looking to over, turn over the government, and then don't assume the other side is overly woke. One of those sides is literally backing a guy who overturned, tried to overturn the election. And wokeism, I won't get too into it, but it's basically a good thing that got hijacked by one side. So my question is, do you have to kind of compromise what truth is and what morality is to meet somewhere in the middle? Because if, if you have to, if your starting point is don't assume we're trying to overturn an election, but you're talking to a guy who's supporting someone overturning an election, how do you look at this in, an, um, in a flat way without saying, how are you sorting that out in your brain? Right, no, no fair, fair question. Let me just say, these are governors, and, and what I can see is it's very difficult for governors, to, and, and even for companies, to operate in this highly polarized environment. It's costly, governors have to get things done, um, and so these guys are moderate, right? You can see whether they support Donald Trump all the way, and who knows. But uh, this guy, Spencer Cock, has been on this kick. I mean, he really is determined to try and bring the temperature down. And I think for them, the Governors Association, they need to work together. Um, they can't afford to have these kinds of divisions. If you got them in a private room, they'd probably agree with you, right? I mean, they probably agree that this kind of conflict is very detrimental. What we need are politicians with courage to stand up to this, right? I mean, you know, if you're, if you're trying to be an effective politician, what we're seeing is not effective, right? I mean, and I will say, politics is about compromise. So whether we have to, I don't want to compromise the truth, but it is about compromise. Uh, that is the part and parcel and definition of what politics is. And so I always say this, politics is not a religion, despite appearances. It is not a religion, it is about getting things done. <laughs> so on that note, I'll turn it over to Carl. <laughs> Save me from the political heat. <laughs>